Um, welcome everybody to my Research Ed Home presentation. I'm Carly Waterman. Um, I'm not a researcher with a published uh, body of work to present to you. Um, I don't even have a book to promote. I haven't read, written a book. Um, I do write some blogs sometimes, but not enough. Um, however, I am the head teacher of this secondary school here, Lodge Park Academy in Corby. And if that doesn't qualify me to talk about leadership, then I'm not quite sure what does. Um, I have been a consumer of educational leadership research for years and years um, and the constantly evolving debates around leadership is something I'm fascinated with and it is my particular area of interest. So my presentation this morning, um, which is without slides, um, is called Love and Knowledge in Leadership um, and I'd like to start with a disclaimer. Um, everything I present is my opinion. It's based on reading and research, yes, but it is also my opinion. So I don't claim to be presenting any great truth. Um, I simply want to add to the debate to promote thought and discussion. So I don't present anything here with huge certainty. So if you're here for answers, probably worth logging off now. Um, and in fact, I want to say that I am actually very strongly suspicious of certainty. Um, and for me, certainly, as soon as I thing. I ask myself, but what if I'm wrong? Um, and I'm quite sure that's a fairly healthy way to be. Um, I also think that within our profession, sometimes there's a bit too much certainty. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you today about a binary that exists. And I think that one of the reasons why that, that binary continue, continues to be quite polarized is because um, everybody is so certain. Um, and in that binary, those certainties become so cemented that what happens is, if you sit on the fence or remain objective or perhaps try and gain some consensus, um, you're seen as weak, you're seen as having no opinion, you know, you're pressurised into taking a position. But I just can't. I just can't. I try really hard to, but um, every time I try and fit into a camp, I just feel like I have to come back out again. And I've always approached everything in education um, with what I call respectful scepticism. And thus far, it has protected me from falling headlong into the sinkhole of education fads, and it has allowed me to keep on learning. Um, and as a leader, I think that's key. So I would say, you know, when it comes to leadership or anything indeed in education, have an opinion, then change your mind, refute past proclamations of certainty, jump the fence, sit on the fence, join a new camp, defect back again. It's okay, it's all learning. So, um, why does this debate um, about leadership that I'm going to talk about today, why is this, why does it even currently exist? Well, there's no agreed concept of leadership and we know from various meta-analyses of leadership research that there are loads and loads and loads of types of leadership which are examined in the research literature and also there's a load more that just get made up as we go along. So you will have heard for our example of transformational leadership, distributed leadership, instructional leadership, democratic leadership, transactional, servant ethical, the list goes on and on. All very worthy. And, and having read a considerable amount about those and other types, I have found them to be, I, I genuinely do find them truly fascinating and compelling. Um, and again, I don't get out much. Mind you, neither of us, none of us do these days, do we? Um, the big question for me, the big question um, is, what is helpful? What is helpful to me as a leader? What type of leadership actually helps me to do my job? I mean, don't get me wrong, I would more than happily read and debate and reflect on types of leadership for fun. Um, but I have to say that there is a big gulf between the things that I read and then what I have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's no agreed definition um, of leadership, no agreed concept and um, because of that, it's this, it's very, very big and it's very, very complex. Um, and because it's complex as a concept and there's all of these, you know, huge amounts of, of definitions, I think there's a risk. There's a big risk that whenever there's anything complex, what we do as human beings is we kind of try and hang our hat on something pithy. I love that phrase, pithy. Um, something, you know, we hang our hat on something that's something that resonates, um, like a catchphrase, a mantra, a metaphor, um, a sort of a way of making something that's really big and complex more palatable. Um, if you happen to have Disney Plus, which let's face it, it's kind of a lockdown essential. So many of us have Disney Plus. If you happen to have Disney Plus, I would highly recommend watching uh, the short film, Forky Asks a Question, What is a Leader? Because it sums up this point perfectly. Sort of the, the idea that a catchphrase can become the be all and end all of leadership. And what I would say is this, is leadership quotations, are fine 
but they are not the sum of what they do of what we do they are not the sum of what we do and if we hang our hat too much on leadership quotations and catchphrases we move into the realms of genericism so that is kind of a brief overview of our sort of complex and messy context. So what am I actually offering up for debate today? Um, so in this talk, I uh, am gonna offer you this hypothesis. First of all, I believe that there is, and there needs to be a renewed focus on knowledge in leadership. And I think this for two reasons. Firstly, because I think that values-based leadership that isn't grounded in knowledge um, leads to superficiality and can be dangerous. And B, I think that generic leadership, the kind that I just described, that's full of catchphrases, um, has become too dominant. So a call to arms from those who believe in knowledge, I think, is a very natural reaction. Um, although, actually, at some point later on, I am going to also argue that the things that we think are generic might not actually be generic after all. Um, and so... And secondly, um, I think that whilst we also struggle to, the second thing I'm going to talk about is that whilst we struggle to come to this sort of agreed concept of leadership, I'm going to argue that actually we struggle even more to come to a shared understanding of knowledge. Um, well, us and, and the whole of humankind since the dawn of time, of course, because this is not a new problem. Um, and what I'm going to suggest is that perhaps a more socially constructed view of knowledge might come in handy. Um, it, mind you, regardless of what you think knowledge is or what knowledge isn't, a knowledge based view of leadership is something I'm arguing for today and it is something I'm a fan of because to me it is inclusive and it's hopeful. And because it's inclusive, um, I want to ask the question, how do we make or train people to become good leaders? And I have got a couple of suggestions based on my personal experience. Um, and then towards the end, I will I will talk about love and I will ask, how, what does it mean to be a good leader? Um, somebody who leads with love. Um, and the answer, because I'm gonna reveal it right away at the start is more knowledge. Um, in particular, the knowledge that you need to build relational trust. And I'm going to, at the end, draw particularly on the work of Vivian Robinson. However, before we do all of that, I am going to start with this. This, um, this book, John Tomsett's book. Um, Written in 2015, um, John Tomsett writes this book um, um, and it's called This Much I Know About Love Over Fear. Um, it's based on a, his blogs and his first blog was back in 2013. And that blog began, I've been a teacher for 24 years and a head teacher for nine years. And at the age of 47, this much I know about. That was his first blog. Uh, the last blog, which was just a couple of weeks ago, was I've been a teacher for 31 years, a head teacher for 16 years, and at the age of 55, this much I know about. I love this. First of all, I love the fact that John begins with his experience. And I love the fact that if we read his blogs over the years, he gets older and more experienced. I love that. And um, that's putting, you know, experience first, putting experience in the foreground. But then he says, this much I know. So it is about knowledge, but it's also about saying, I don't know everything. It's just this much I know. Um, and then he talks about love over fear. Um, and to me, that's very courageous, putting love front and center. Um, I believe, and I, I know that John believes that teaching and leading schools is a human endeavor that is based on love, um, love for humanity for the rich potential of children the adults they become the relationships we form for the difference we make and then by all means call me a hopeless romantic um, i don't care that's what i am um, because what i do is is based on love so thank you john for giving me permission and others permission to lead with experience with knowledge and with love um, so i just want to clarify what i mean by love in this context um, i mean two things so i mean the genuine love that i feel and you will feel the same no doubt if you're a school leader as well but the genuine love that i feel for my school community um, that's include the staff and, uh, and students and their families here at lodge park academy um, but it's also for me linked to the idea that this is my hometown um, and I feel a really deep emotional connection with the history and development of the town. I belong here um, and it's, it's a commitment not just to the school and its students but to the town as a whole, um, to how it's viewed by the world and its regeneration. The second way that I think about love uh, and the thing that's I guess most relevant for my discussion today is that sort of and I would say visceral and strong emotional connection with the idea of being a values driven leader. Um, and I would say that 
it's taken me personally a long time to get to this point. I wasn't actually always sure about what, that, what it meant, what it meant to have values. And I still think it's fraught with difficulty, which I'll go on to explain in a moment. Um, now, I am a strong believer in knowledge, as you'll see, and as, as part of my argument today, but I don't see values as being incompatible with knowledge. In fact, I am more certain now about my values because of the knowledge I have. One begets the other. Values without basis are just empty words. And uh, as the lovely Mary Myatt would say, values need to be lived, not laminated. So now you know what I mean by love. Um, and what I want to do now is I want to um, place everything um, that I'm going to say into the context of the debate, the, this leadership debate that uh, LM discussed at the beginning. Um, now, it's captured beautifully in um, Steve Mumby's um, paper of last week, I think, called A New Paradigm for Leadership Development. Fantastic paper that I would highly recommend that you read. Um, and it's also um, a debate that's been going on at the moment with thinkers such as Matthew Evans, who wrote this book, Leaders with Substance, an Antidote to Leadership, Generalism in Schools, which is fantastic. Another, another reader would highly recommend. I keep going back to it. And also um, a lot of the work being done um, by the folks at Ambition, so Jen Barker and her sidekick, Tom Reese. Um, and I'm really grateful to all of those thinkers and other voices as well who are bringing this debate to the fore because, again, I find it really fascinating. I find it really compelling. However, I think it's important to say that it's not a new argument um, and nor is it an argument that is exclusive to leadership or education nor is it an argument that exists in a vacuum so you might call it an argument between knowledge and values or you might call it an argument between traditionalists and progressives or you might call it an argument between reason and emotion it makes no difference the point is it's been around forever um, I'm going to call it today um, knowledge and values, but actually what it is, is an age old gulf between emotion and reason. Um, right back from Aristotle through to um, medieval religious dogma, to the Enlightenment and to the real dominant Western culture, there is this continual cultural bias that has perpetuated this binary between reason and emotion. Um, and in many quarters, um, this idea of reason, cognition, knowledge is given primacy over emotion, love, values. Um, and emotion and love and values are seen what uh, Professor Brenda Beatty calls the pesky interloper, um, because historically the knowledge camp has always had the upper hand. The thing is, it's a culturally embedded dichotomy that pitches reason and rationality as polarities to emotion and values, uh, where this, this camp of values and emotion gets equated with being a bit primitive or a bit messy, unreliable, um, and reason and rationality and knowledge is regarded as being sort of the origins of calculated decision making. Values, warm, fuzzy, lovely. Knowledge, cold, heartless, logical. Humans have never been very good at nuance. Um, now, Jill and Arnold in 2015 in their research on head teachers found that actually head teachers are in a tough position because they are a kind of amalgam, a combination of both person and position. So they're grappling with this pressure to use reason, logic, knowledge, but it kind of feels at odds. It feels at odds with the, the emotional organization that you're running schools because schools are the, a human realm um, and frequently because of that your sense of self becomes compromised i mean way back in 1935 the scottish philosopher uh, john mcmurray said that that kind of pressure that compromising of self actually cripples us one of the things that i think it does and i think um and research suggests and certainly uh, researchers morrison and eccleston in 2001 suggest that is a risk of us as head teachers um kind of wanting just to focus on something which is too easy then it becomes a sort of a reductionist competency approach to leadership um, in which the sort of pop psychology construct of leadership of personality traits that can techniques that can be ticked off become really attractive and elevated to like a mythical status um, and that's the thing that produces all these inspirational quotes and statements it's massively popular it's a big industry now of course 
Matthew Evans and Jen Barker and Tom Reese and others, these voices are presenting a view of leadership which is a reaction to that kind of leadership. What they want to champion is a more domain specific type of leadership which elevates educational expertise. Now, Steve Mumby in this paper um, expressed a concern that too much of a focus on domain specific leadership might mean that the softer side of leadership ends up being sidelined. I understand that concern, but I don't share it um, because, first of all, I'm a hopeless romantic and I think you can never dampen the power of love. Um, but going back to the argument, Steve says that unless we attend to the love side of leadership, we may not be successful in taking people with us in our aim to lead the organisation forward. So he feels that we should lead with concepts such as love, determination and kindness, and that if we don't, we risk having very clever leaders who make the right decisions, who solve complex problems, but fail to attract discretionary effort from those they lead. Now, I think you can probably tell that I am a big fan of leading with love, is the title of my presentation. Um, but I don't agree with that view, because to me, if you are making the right decisions and you are solving complex problems based on domain specific expertise, that is exactly how you would attract discretionary effort. And that is in fact leading with love. Because if you lead with love, you would want to use expert knowledge to make the right decisions for the people you lead and to solve the complex problems of schools. You don't distract, um, sorry, you don't attract discretionary effort by, by sort of telling people that you lead with love. You get it by making good decisions that respect people's circumstances and create the conditions for a happy workforce. Um, but, but that aside for a second, why is there this renewed focus on knowledge? Um, and I would say that if you are interested in this, um, tune in to Research at Home on Friday, where Jen Barker and Tom Reese will be presenting their idea of um, expert educators. Well, um, I sort of think that one of the reasons why that this, there is this renewed focus on knowledge, and I, I, I briefly sort of um, intimated it earlier, is because there is something has gone wrong with values based leadership, which might seem like quite a curious thing to say. Um, but I think it's true. I think that values in a way have become mutated and distorted by that generic kind of leadership, by genericism that I described earlier. And, and, and values have become very synonymous with genericism. And so now values are kind of viewed as fluffy at best and worst at worst have become sort of dirty words. I really, I really object to that. Um, but I understand why it's happened. And I want to just share an anecdote with you, um, which I think um, exemplifies how this has happened. So I was at a, um, a leadership development course many years ago. And the first session, which is often the case in leadership development courses, um, you had to choose the three values that represented your leadership style and you had to write them on post-it notes. I freaked out. I mean, I, I genuinely freaked out. I, I, uh, I almost cried. <laughs> um, and why was that? Well, it was because all of these people around me were like getting their post-it notes, they were writing their values. Um, and I was thinking, oh my goodness, what are my values? I actually don't know. Um, maybe I am just subhuman or something. I mean, it's sort of a genuine feeling of chest tightening fear because, you know, if values are so integral to leadership and I don't feel I have any, then how could I ever be a head teacher? Um, am I even a person at all? So why was I having that crisis? <laughs> it sounds ridiculous. Um, I think I know why I was having that crisis. Now, just to put it into context, at that time, I was a deputy head teacher in a school and that school had and still has very very clear values i had helped to define those values i embodied them in everything i did so it wasn't that i didn't know what values were that's not it i did know what they were um, it was that the the emphasis was on you having defined them and clarified them exactly so that and this is you exposing yourself and saying this is the person that i am to me that's a huge huge pressure um, that your values have to define who you are as a person and i think it also can be potentially dangerous because it leads you to panicking like panic buying uh, when you go to the supermarket when you're hungry um you know you, you think oh my gosh i need some values quick what ones can i choose i'm a bit like sort of selecting them from a menu um, like it's just a choice you make um so 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 this is what this is what i did so i, I wrote down my three values on post-it notes so um i decided i thought okay three values quick what am i going to go for i'll go for integrity respect 
and courage. Integrity, respect and courage. Yeah, they are good. They are good values, aren't they? And then someone else across the table from me said, yeah, well, mine are diversity, inclusion and aspiration. Oh, God. Wow. They are so good. Mine aren't as good as your values. Oh, so what do we have? A situation where we're pitting our values, my values against your values. And if we choose some values, we leave others out. Um, and let's face it, they all resonate. So, you know, I could have a list of like 44 values. Um, you see, the thing is values in that sense as words, they're just abstractions. And of course they resonate with us because, you know, they're the language of equality or of poetry, of songs, of, of, of legends, of art. And as humans, we seek to be inspired. Words inspire us, values inspire us, even more so if they signal our virtue. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that values are not important. I think they're massively important, but I believe we can only carry out our values with integrity if we have the knowledge base to make good decisions which enact our values. So to me, values is about the decisions you make. Um, and I'm going to give you a quick example. Um, this isn't a personal example, but it's something that a, a friend of mine told me. So um, imagine you're a head teacher, um, a member of staff comes to you and they say to you that they have got a, a seriously ill child, um, a child who will probably get better, but it's going to take a very, very long time with a lot of treatment. Now, as a values based leader, uh, you might decide that. Uh, and this person did decide that because you know you have compassion you want to make sure that that person is fully supported so um, you might decide as a head teacher that that member of staff can have compassionate leave for as long as necessary um, and then say to that person take all the time you need we'll pay we'll pay you in full and you say that because your values tell you that that's the right thing to do but there are huge implications of doing something like that without knowledge and this is what happened in this situation, because what if six months down the line, there are constraints and ramifications that you hadn't considered at the start that force you to let that person down? And in this situation, that person was badly, badly let down. Um, I mean, that isn't a head teacher living their values. Actually, what that is, is a head teacher allowing their values to undermine them as a leader. Because they didn't check. They didn't check the knowledge first um, and there are actually of course as we know statutory and school-based procedures for compassionate leave and of course whilst there is also head teachers discretion and i would definitely be an advocate of supporting people as much as possible you have to make sure you can do it before promising it it's not truly a it's not solely values-based decision it's actually a knowledge-based decision as well and you know even if, if you're a head teacher, and I thought when I heard that story, I thought about myself, I thought, well, what would I do in that situation? I mean, I guess my heart would want me to say, yes, of course, you can have all the time off you need and we'll pay you in full. Of course, that's the sort of natural values-based decision you'd want to make. But I think we need to be, that's why it's risky and we need to be careful. And I think even without the requisite knowledge to make um, a good decision, a far more values-based response would be to say, I want to support you in every way possible. But because I want to do this correctly, um, I want to find out the parameters within which we can do this so that later on down the line, I don't let you down. I want to be transparent with you about your time off, level of pay, level of support, things like that, so that you can have total clarity because clarity is what you deserve. So I don't think you are a values based leader if you make empty promises. Um, you are able to act and behave in a values based way if you have the knowledge to ensure that your actions can support your words. That's why a call to prioritise knowledge in school leadership, um, and particularly in leadership training, I think is a really worthy one because nobody wants leaders who makes empty promises, who say the right words, but then do something very different, a form of laminated leadership, if you will. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I think there's been this, uh, this very uh, welcome focus on knowledge, because I think there, there is an issue with values. Um, but I think it's also to do with, as I said earlier, this sort of rise and rise and rise of pop psychology, folklore style, generic leadership, um, you know, like the kind you see on LinkedIn. 
Now, the folks at Ambition and, and Matthew would argue that this type of leadership by numbers has become too popular, and, and, and I think that's probably true. It's very easy to see why it's popular though, isn't it? Because it's really accessible, it's focused on behaviours and skills, and how those behaviours and skills correlate with success, and hey, who doesn't want to be successful? So I agree that it's, it's dominant, and, uh, and I agree that it's not necessarily a good thing. But my view just is slightly different in the sense that um, I actually don't know that any of the sort of generic behaviours and skills um, that are criticised are actually generic at all. And I, I do wonder whether we might argue that at their heart, they're actually they're actually knowledge based. So let's take the example of communication skills, which is um, the classic generic skill, isn't it? So it's transferable across different domains. So let's just have a think about good communication. So we might want to make good eye contact, uh, listen to the person and give them space to speak. So don't speak too much, don't dominate them. Speak slowly, um, slower than you would expect, which clearly I'm not very good at. Uh, make sure your non-verbal communication cues are open inviting, and then lots of kind of active listening, back channeling, nodding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Um, generic skills, maybe. Um, now, I would consider myself a fairly skilled communicator, but here's the thing. I can do all of those things, but if I have to do all of those things and I have no knowledge, I just crumble. I bluster. I say lots of words and then more words and more words and they don't mean very much. Um, and actually, let's think about it. I can name a number of examples uh, from politicians uh, or from leaders within our country in recent weeks where, you know, even though they've had some, you know, very clear education in being communicators and they've had loads of practice, they're still not credible when it's clear they don't have the knowledge. I don't think it matters how good a communicator you are really, uh, people will see through you. Um, and so, you know, maybe we could argue that there has been too much emphasis on things like, you know, communication or other um, generic skills. Um, but actually in the end, communication is really important and it's really important because you have to know your stuff. So maybe what we do is we just change the focus. So we change the focus to knowledge. When I think about the multiple conversations that I have throughout any one day, whatever they might be, uh, meetings, assemblies, informal chats, whatever, I'm always a better communicator when I know my stuff. When I don't know my stuff, I can sort of get through it, um, but I know I could have been better because, you know, I was basically winging it. Um, so, you know, you could argue that communication can be taught as a generic standalone skill and that might well be useful to a point. But when you are talking about leadership, when you are enacting leadership through communication with fidelity, with love, the people you are leading deserve for their leaders to be basing their communication on knowledge. But let's take this a tiny bit further um, and I'm going to give the examples that Steve Mumby cites in his paper, which is fantastic. Um, and he's talking about these generic leadership skills. Um, and I argue that these are actually sites of knowledge. So Steve Mumby cites these six things, developing a, seat, a deep self-awareness, collective, sorry, building a collective vision, chairing a meeting effectively, providing support and challenge, building trust and holding difficult conversations. First of all, I agree that they're really important, but I think I would argue that they're not generic at all. I think I think I could argue that every single one of them to be enacted effectively is dependent upon the level of knowledge you bring to each of those situations. Whether that knowledge is contextual or formal or, or knowledge of people or behaviour, it's still knowledge. Um, I think this is the problem. I think it's actually the issue that we don't all hold the same view of knowledge. We have different perceptions of knowledge. So when Steve Mumby argues that these things, um, albeit generic, are important, you know, I, I, we're not disagreeing. I think they are, they are important. I just don't think they're generic. Um, and actually, in the end, I don't know that it really matters. Now, I want to just talk a little bit about knowledge because I think that's where things get slightly messy here. Now, um, Jen Barker and Tom Rees in their recent work des describe knowledge or they define knowledge as four things. So formal, informal, impressionistic and self-regulatory. Um, and in uh, Seven Strong Claims of Strong Leadership, uh, Leithwood and Powell's, they didn't necessarily talk specifically about knowledge, but they did talk about cognitive leadership resources, which they defined as domain specific knowledge, expert problem solving and systems thinking. Um, in 2015, Helen Timperley said that whilst there is not a lot of clarity about uh, kinds of knowledge needed for effective leadership, um, there is an important distinction drawn that needs to be drawn between declarative knowledge and procedural knowledge. And kind of at this point, I'm 
beginning to lose the plot because there's that's a lot of different types of knowledge. So let's just play a quick game. So if you're watching this um, afterwards, if you're not watching this live, if you're watching it on YouTube, at this point, you could pause the video and play this game properly. The rest of us will just do it together. So let's play a little game and say over the past two years, three years, um, what, what are the different types of knowledge that you have encountered in education? So here goes, let me think about it for a second. Uh, substantive, formal, informal, declarative, procedural, disciplinary, impressionistic, tacit, self-regulatory, did I say that already? Flexible, core, hinterland, oh my goodness. We worry about not having a shared concept of leadership. All these adjectives, we don't have a, we don't have a shared concept of knowledge. And I think that's a risk. I think for those of us who are wanting to argue that knowledge is important, we've got to be wary of the fact that there are all of these different definitions of, of knowledge now, and that puts people off. So perhaps instead we think about ways of knowing. Um, Professor Brenda Beatty in 2002 said, the way we view knowledge shapes and reflects our sense of reality. Now, there's probably not time here to go into very deep ontological arguments, but I think it's helpful to think about knowledge in this way, because if you consider that knowledge is, is socially constructed, and you may disagree with this, which is fine, it is worth remembering that this is an age old argument and it is part of that binary, that one that I mentioned earlier. Um, social constructionists would argue that the path to knowledge is iterative um, and it's validated by our beliefs and assumptions that actually all knowledge really is is an interpretation of information data and experience and that forms our mental mo models which then shift and reshape as we encounter new knowledge which then fits our beliefs you see we're far more likely to accept new knowledge if those bits of new knowledge fit our existing belief systems our existing mental models um, Daniel Willingham talks about this in his book, uh, When Can You Trust the Experts? How to Tell Good Science from Bad in Education. Um, he describes beliefs and values as a web, much like our mental model metaphor, uh, where each fact that we believe is interconnected to other facts. And when we come up against fact, facts that bump into our sacred values, we reject them as untrue. I mean, whatever knowledge is, um, however you might view knowledge, whether you view it in a socially constructed way or whether you want to pin it down and define it. To me, the important thing about it is if we focus on it in leadership, knowledge in leadership, we are being inclusive and hopeful. What do I mean by that? Well, inclusive because if you focus on knowledge, you don't rely on anything innate like personality or charisma, which just perpetuates that hero myth, which means and basically it's inclusive because it says that anybody can be a good head teacher. Um, so that more domain specific approach to leadership is far more inclusive. And as Steve Mumby said in his book, Imperfect Leadership last year, 2019, um, that sort of a lot, a lot of people are put off leadership because they think they have to be the perfect leader. Um, so if you make leadership about knowledge and less about personality, you invite more people in. So it's inclusive. I think that's a really good thing. Now, you know, I have to admit um, that deep down inside, <laughs> Deep down inside, there's something I disagree with there, um, which isn't very, very personal, really. But, you know, I guess partly, you know, I like a charismatic leader who doesn't. I also kind of quite want to be a charismatic leader. And I joke with Tom Reese fairly regularly that I don't know that I'm completely ready to reject um, the old superhero metaphor just yet. I think it appeals to my ego. Now, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. But whatever it is, it's honest. What I do see, though, very, very clearly is that the hero paradigm of school leadership, it just isn't scalable. And we do. We absolutely do have a head teacher recruitment and retention issue. Um, and if we are reliant on hero heads, well we're not really helping ourselves we can't just hope for chance encounters with great people instead it's far more hopeful to have faith in our legions of teachers and their ability to be taught how to be expert leaders that's why it's hopeful so the million dollar question if we are saying that we can train everybody to be head teachers good good leaders um, then how um, I have four suggestions, four quick suggestions for you. So this is how I think we should train um, uh, potential aspiring leaders. Point one, don't mimic observable behavior. If we try to mimic the observable behaviors of leaders or actions of leaders, 
all we can ever do is act in a very superficial way. And I think this is particularly true when we're watching um, values based leaders, um, because when we're learning to be a leader, we might look at the decisions that a leader makes and look at their actions and behavior. And we might think, oh, yeah, I really admire that person. I am going to behave that way when I'm a leader. Um, and we think that without really considering the kind of knowledge architecture of the decisions that we've seen. Um, and, and when you do that, um, you, so you copy them, you might do what you think expert leaders do, you might say the same things, um, you might behave the same way, and then you find you're not, it's not going that well, <laughs> you're not executing it in a very effective way. Well, uh, and, and then what happens is you start to go, it must be me, I must be rubbish, I'm not good enough, I'm not cut out for this, I think I'll leave. We don't want leaders to leave, we want them to stay. So don't mimic leaders. Um, successful leaders, regardless of how charismatic they are or not, have a body of knowledge, a well-developed mental model of school leadership, and it can't be seen by anyone else. It's, it's invisible. In fact, it's so invisible that even expert leaders themselves don't see it. You see the curse of the expert. Um, their uh, knowledge is executed so fluidly that they don't even realise it's based on knowledge at all. So we definitely don't want to go down that road. So that's my first tip. My second um, advice for developing expert leaders would be don't treat them like they know nothing. Now, I do swing around a bit on this, I have to admit, but um, I've been a head teacher since September 2019. So I am nine months into this job. And frankly, sometimes I do really feel like a novice um, because some days I feel like I know absolutely nothing. Um, I have to admit yesterday was one of those. <laughs> um, but I think most of us were in a, having a crisis yesterday when we were reading that document. Anyway, um, it's really easy to sometimes feel like you know nothing, um, especially when you are surrounded by the noise of other people in education saying what they know and they are also certain and they're reading off the facts and they're citing all the research um it's just really easy to feel like a novice or indeed like an imposter uh, like a fraud you know how did i even get this job um but that's it's very natural and i would say to myself that the day that i feel like i know everything and have nothing more to learn is the day i walk away so even though i may feel like i know nothing it's not really true my mental model has developed over time. I have had different encounters with different types of knowledge, formal, impressionistic, whatever you want to call it. Um, and as an experienced school leader, I, I have that. I have that mental model that I bring with me to the job that I do. The thing is, my mental model is probably a bit deputy head teacher shaped at the moment, um, but it is one that is really well developed, especially because I've been a school leader for over a decade and I've had lots of responsibilities when I, when I was a deputy head teacher. So it's not true that I'm a novice completely. I just need to develop my mental model. I need to extend it further. Um, I mean, okay, fair enough. If you're talking about head teachers who like, got the role after two years of teaching, then fine, give them direct instruction by all means. But I've been a head teacher for nine months, but a deputy head teacher for over a decade. I have a huge amount of experience to bring. I don't know that that makes me a novice. I mean, sure, there's stuff I don't know, of course, but not much of it is new knowledge. What I don't know is just sort of extensions of my current mental model and they need to be developed further. And what I want to get to is the sort of what Matthew Evans talks about, the fluid execution of the task. And that being dependent, of course, on this deep knowledge of the domain. And that's, of course, what I want to achieve. So my third advice for developing um, expert leaders is to codify the knowledge. And I mean the formal knowledge here. Um, some people say that you don't know what you don't know. I disagree with that <laughs> because I feel like I do know what I don't know um, and I feel like I know it because it sort of knocks against me every single day I encounter it all the time um, because when anything is asked of me or demanded of me or something that I have to do I realize there are bits about it that I don't know and that that's a moment of clarity for me and that's the moment that um you know it's the extension of the mental model that I was talking about and it's when I go and read up on it and I find out about things so for example I'm doing something and I realize I don't know enough about financial due diligence um but I do have a very well developed mental model about school finance so that's fine I'll just go and ask um, someone about it or I'll find out I will fill that knowledge gap but I do think it would be really useful if we could codify the knowledge we need as leaders in education. And I know some people would argue that the domain is so big, uh, we can't possibly do that. I mean, I'm not saying it could fit into a uh, pocket sized walkthrough, but I do think um, that especially with the uh, definition of the persistent problems of leadership, which Jen and Tom will talk about on, on Friday, I think there is a potential for a shared body of knowledge in our profession, or even just a sort of central place where you, you can go to as a sort of guide. And you know, the thing about this is it's not very sexy you know it's um 
it's the school teachers paying conditions, it's the burgundy book, it's the academy's financial handbook, it's every policy ever written. It's a bit boring. <laughs> but I really wish that somebody had told me this at the start of being a deputy head teacher. Because I remember going in at the start of being a deputy head and thinking, I could just inspire everybody with my charismatic personality. <laughs> and to be fair, I think I did an okay job at that. But the real work, the substance of the role, improving teaching, managing capability, disciplinaries, unions, industrial tribunals, admissions appeals, exclusions, appeals against exclusions, safeguarding legislation, financial risk management, etc., 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 that came from formal knowledge reading all the documents and that is my fourth my fourth tip and my fourth piece of advice about developing expert leaders is read all the documents there's no point in looking at someone else doing it all really well and thinking you can learn from watching them because you can't as i said already their knowledge is invi invisible all you are seeing is the enactment of their formal but now flexible knowledge so if you try to replicate or imitate at best you'll do it superficially and risk looking a bit stupid but at worst you'll do harm because many of the decisions that school leaders make do have the potential to cause harm which is why it's such an important and responsible job and why it's worthy of this level of scrutiny and debate um, in the book putting staff first johnny uckley writes good leadership multiplies positive effects on more lives but bad leadership multiplies the negatives. Now, Johnny's talking about mat leadership at that point, but it, it's a relevant point here as well. Basically, if it's done well, it multiplies positive effects with more people. If it's done badly, it multiplies the negative effects. So we have a moral obligation to do leadership well and to train aspiring leaders well. It's, it's too important not to. So read the school handbook, go to the gov.uk website, when it's working use the key use askel all the places wherever you need to get the knowledge use the knowledge read all the documents the more you use it the more flexible that knowledge becomes your mental model becomes more secure you get to the point where you know the procedures the process without even to ha even having to have the policy or the equivalent document in front of you although i would always recommend having it in front of you just in case and there you go that's my four recommendations for training effective leaders so if we do that just say we you know, because, you know, this idea of knowledge based leadership is very inclusive and it's very hopeful and it means that we can train everybody to be a good head teacher. So we do that. How do we make them? How do we help them to be a good leader? As in, how do we help them to lead with love? Well, you know, um, maybe there are many ways, but I am going to put forward this. Um, I am going to put forward that it is about amalgamating knowledge and values into relational trust. Because to me, relational trust, which I'm only going to just touch on briefly here, um, is as much an endeavour for knowledge as it is an endeavour for connecting with people. Uh, now, Vivian Robinson is who you need to read to, to find out more about relational trust. And, and Vivian talks about listening to teachers, understanding their beliefs and values, creating a space for this to be explored and discussed, a kind of dialogic inquiry where the aim is to know, the aim is to acquire knowledge knowledge of what preconceived ideas people have, uh, what they're bringing with them, what is preventing them from improving, what's holding them back. And there is absolutely nothing fluffy about relational trust because it is about knowing your staff. It doesn't mean knowing their names, the subjects they teach and their value added score. It means acting with love to open a space for challenging and robust conversations to take place where everyone moves forward in their understanding. I think this is really important in leadership because if we accept that leadership is about improving schools. Well, then we have to know our staff, the people who are frontline, doing the job of teaching and supporting children. Relational trust, it also, the other good thing about it is it really avoids this trap of being about personality or charisma or generic relationships. It's, relational trust isn't about getting on well with people. Um, it's also not an abstract notion about being trustworthy. It's a codified and evidence-based practice that's focused on the core problem of schools. That is the problem of how to get people to teach children. Um, Vivian Robinson says, leaders cannot solve such problems on their own. They need to build trust with teachers who may be skeptical, who have different beliefs about what works in their classrooms. You see, Robinson believes that the core work of leaders is a largely social process, and it requires leaders to have a high ability in building relational trust. So. That's what we're aiming for, isn't it? Leaders who build relational trust, who make good decisions 
ethical values-based decisions that are based on deep knowledge that are, and, and make decisions that are executed fluidly. Um, and I would argue that today, in the situation that we're in, this crisis that we're in, uh, leadership based on knowledge is more important than ever because the job of head teacher suddenly got a whole lot more serious. You know, I am no longer just the guardian of my students' academic and personal achievement. The decisions I make may impact on whether they or their family stay well, get ill, or even die. <sighs> Expert decisions based on all available information are really, really important. But it's also important that I am a values-based leader because I need to make decisions that are grounded in my knowledge and understanding of my people, their hopes, their fears, and I need to make sure that my decisions are based on love. Now, it's not knowledge or values, it's both, and it's both to me because they're the same thing. You can't have values that you exercise with fidelity without deep knowledge, and you don't know that something is true unless it fits your belief system. Now, you may well, you may well reject what I'm saying here as fence sitting, but hey, I've been a teacher for 20 years and a head teacher for nine months and this much I know about love and knowledge. They are one and the same. Values-based decisions are knowledge-based decisions. Effective and trusting conversations between people are based on knowledge, deep knowledge, not just of formal domain but of context and of oneself. In the Journal for Values-Based Leadership in 2019, um, Joanne Smickel writes, self-knowledge of one's values provides the leader with a foundation and a clarity to face new experiences with surety. She goes on to say that values exploration isn't um, about guiding leaders in exploring theoretically nebulous concepts, it's about actions. And it is. It's not just about the words, it's about behaviours. It's not about quotations, it's about knowledge. Um, we can all think of leaders, I'm sure, who can reel off values but don't enact them. And here's the thing, I don't think those people are bad people. I would argue that, and it's also not even just the lack of values that's the problem, it's the lack of an expert mental model to support their values. And because then they become susceptible to genericism, to the peripheral cues, as Daniel Willingham calls them, and therefore they don't exercise those values with fidelity. And so we do need to make knowledge the priority in leadership, but I don't mean a narrow view of knowledge. Um, I do think we need a, a, a codified body of formal knowledge, but I also think we need to draw on knowledge drawn from experience, knowledge of self and others, and knowledge that is grounded in the act of relational trust. That, for me, adds up to a whole lot of love. And, and so I conclude with this. I thought the SLT chat on Twitter on Sunday was fantastic. Um, there was a clear consensus from serving head teachers that values are really important right now, not because they're abstract but because they are lived and they are real and they are based on knowing. Um, and a very wise person asked me the other day, what are the three pieces of knowledge you have drawn on most in this crisis? I thought carefully about it and I'd love to be able to say it's the official documents I've received from the documents, but I definitely couldn't. Um, I think the knowledge I have drawn on most in this crisis is knowledge of my staff, knowledge of my students and knowledge of my community. And I think that is what is truly meant by leading from the heart, knowing your people, their beliefs, their values, their prejudices, their deficits, their weaknesses, their strengths. That information forms my very specific and expert interconnected web of if you will, and that guides my actions. Um, and so and so that's it. Um, that um, is my debate. Um, and I think I just want to say that it is a debate. It's not a certainty and I would ask everybody who who is interested in leadership to come to this debate come with your knowledge and your experience and your position if you will but perhaps hold those things lightly because unless we do it's no debate at all it's just a fight and it's just about winning and I think that the world is wide enough for all our views um, and so Ellen that's the end of my presentation oh, what a presentation <laughs> absolutely fabulous um, and and um, and I can imagine some pushback, um, but I'm also really thrilled that uh, you know you you have um, stirred the pot a little bit. And uh, can I just? And we've we've had a few questions, and I've got a few questions myself. Um, but um, 
you've, you've mentioned Steve a few times, you've shown his, his documents, so Steve Mumby is asking, um, surely once you have looked at all the knowledge available, you can still make different decisions based on your values. So it is not all about knowledge or all about values, but both, which I think you kind of said yourself, you know, before the end of your talk. Yeah, no, so I think I think actually um, we're in agreement there, Steve, and I absolutely loved this paper. I really did. And I think it's a it's, it's helped me enormously because I've been grappling with these issues a lot um, over the last couple of months. Um, I think it is. It, it, they are one and the same thing. I think the values are based on knowledge. Um, and I also think that the knowledge that we continue to acquire as we move through our experience, as Daniel Willingham says, you know, that actually the, the new sort of bits of knowledge that we gain actually are the things that are fitting into our belief systems, which are based on our values. So I genuinely don't see them as different. I do think that they are the same thing. And I think sometimes we might be operating more from a knowledge base and sometimes we might be operating more from a values base, depending upon the, the context and the situation that we're in. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, the job of a head teacher or the job of a school leader is so incredible because it changes constantly and you are or you, the demands upon you are, are altering all the time and you need to be able to respond um, to each of those different things in a different way and you are drawing upon your repertoire of, of, of understanding and knowledge and values all the time and drawing to the foreground the thing that you need most at that time so I definitely I, I'm I think we're in agreement I think they are the same and they are used you know we should use them both thank you all right. To what extent do you think that we can consider leadership as defined by those who are being led and their perceptions? I think that taps into um, what you were talking about, uh, relational trust. I think, Lee, I think it's, I think, reverse the question. If we don't consider leadership as being about the perceptions of the people who are led, I think that is a potentially dangerous ground because what that means is that we are only the people who are defining leadership are the people who are leaders themselves and i think that can be mean it, it can really try um keep um you know perpetuating that hero that hero myth and it being all about ego so i think actually the sense of um of servant leadership that idea of you are you are made a leader by the people who who follow you and actually looking at at their perspective and their understanding and bringing their knowledge into your perception of leadership is just as important so um i'm a fan of that too okay um what do you think of the uh, NPQ programmes as they are and um, what would you like to see revised? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I, <laughs> I, have a, I have a number of views on the NPQs. Um, I can see that they are flawed um, and I've listened to a lot of the arguments about them being flawed. Um, and I definitely think, as I sort of suggested in my presentation, that I think there are there are ways in which we can we could um, make the MPQs um, more about knowledge and expertise that would be more useful. Um, but I also think it's about um, it's about what you bring to any learning experience that you have. So, you know, I did my MPQH, God, when, I don't know, like 2000 and, 2007, I think. Um, yeah, a long time ago. And, and, and my version of the MPQH that I did is one that is just sort of widely derided now as being all generic and not great. And loads of people say it was rubbish. Um, but I loved it. And I loved it because I think it's about what you bring. Um, I enter into every single learning opportunity that I have with an open mind. Um, I always have my filter on, so I've got my respectful scepticism filter on all the time. And I, you know, if there's stuff that I think isn't worthy, that's fine. I, I can reject it, but I'm not going to judge somebody for it. Um, and then I take from it what I can. I think the network opportunities were fantastic. And some of the activities that we did on my MPQH, which again are the sorts of examples that people give now of, you know, um, of things that are kind of really superficial and, and not very useful i just loved them <laughs> you know you got to build your imaginary school and you got to talk about your mission statements and all those things and you know maybe i was just really naive but i think the point is at that time in my career i found that really really useful and i think that's a point that i didn't make in my presentation really that i think it really depends upon what point you are at in your career um I, I, and that sort of dictates what's most useful for you at the time so actually even the things like this of a very generic um, leadership things uh, courses 
that might be really useful to you at some point. You know, it might be that actually you've got a really, really well developed mental model. You've got loads of domain specific expertise and you're a real expert, but you're really lacking in confidence. And maybe then a sort of generic leadership um, course on confidence and communication is just what you need. Um, and equally back, you know, when I was sort of a, an aspiring leader doing that in PQH, um, I really found that all quite useful. So um, I think there is a lot of work to be done on the MPQs. I don't think that it's a bad thing that they're being revised and that the assessment criteria is being revised and I'm really interested um, to see what they will become. Um, I think for me, more than anything else, um, it's about what is useful on the ground. So like I said at the very beginning of my presentation, it's, I mean, I love reading about leadership. I absolutely love it. I love engaging with the theory and engaging with the debate. But what I really want more than anything else is, is stuff that's going to help me do my job really well. Um, and so I think the MPQH can certainly be um, more practical, be based on more experience. I think it's important to have serving head teachers as part of that, um, as well as like really, really understanding that formal knowledge that I talked about as well. I think there's a bit of a gap sometimes um, in, in that we don't really address the formal knowledge that is sometimes needed to be able to carry out the specific actions that you need to carry out as a leader in school and I certainly would have found that more helpful because you kind of you know you you're sort of finding out as you go along really. Hmm. I would recommend the Matthew Evans book as well because he I love it. talks about about this a lot. Yeah, I really, really love this book. Um, and, you know, Matthew has also been really helpful to me as well. So thank you, Matthew, for helping me with my thinking. Um, and also he sort of challenges me, which I think is a good thing, too. Um, and I keep coming back to this. I think it's it's an excellent, excellent book. Um, but I also would still go. I mean, this is an old book now, but so well read. And I really love that, too. And I think that's the thing is that there are there are lots of people within leadership that we can draw on. And lots of them have got all different kinds of experience. And I would just say that we need to just not be disdainful. You know, I think we need to not put ourselves in a camp and say that we can't learn from from other people I don't agree with that I feel like I am so privileged to learn from so many people and I would hate to think that I was close to any of that um, but yeah those, those particular books have been really influential on me thank you perhaps we can squeeze in the last question um, how do you develop and demonstrate your your leadership knowledge as a middle leader with ambition to progress to SLT that's a really good question Any advice? yeah um, well I think actually I would say that middle leadership now is something um, very, very exciting. I think that the, the, the progress that we've made in our knowledge of curriculum and assessment has means now that as a middle leader, you are, you know, you are the sort of, um, you are the guardian of that knowledge um, and, and, and it's, it rests with you. I mean, as a, as a head teacher, I can't possibly have all of the knowledge that I for each of those domains each of those disciplines but as a middle leader you can and you can be really really knowledgeable and I would say um, you know that your subject knowledge itself that disciplinary knowledge that formal knowledge of your, of your subject is, is so so important um, because actually head teachers will rely on you senior leaders will rely on you as a middle leader if you can talk really really authoritatively about your curriculum your subject the content it's sequencing things like that so actually i think right now is a really good time for middle leaders and i don't know that middle leaders always had that kind of role um but i think they do now and I, that's a an exciting place to be so i would say don't apologize for it just read all the books um, know your subject really 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 well and be i would the other thing i would say is always be a champion for your subject so you know even if you're not a subject leader of say an eback subject if you are you know, head of textiles or head of music whatever it might be i think you always be the champion of your subject always fight for your subject um, because uh, i'd say certainly me and i think other school leaders really respect that and then when i was a middle leader i was always uh, championing my subject as well that's kind of what we expect of you um, because sometimes you know head teachers have to make difficult decisions about which subjects get more prominence in a timetable for example um, but never you know never lie down and take it take it easily just you know make sure you stand up for yourself and, and fight for your subject excellent thank you very much <laughs> thank you very much okay. Carly. Uh, I'm really I'm sorry about it. the technical bit at the beginning i suddenly panicked and thought does anybody no 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 that's fine <laughs> <laughs> right um so that was really really enlightening i think um there's a few more questions i will pass them on to you just thank in case you, you and anyone who wants to connect with me feel free to do that on twitter okay all right well have a lovely day thank and, you uh, thank, thank you very much for your time carly hey, you're welcome bye bye uh, and we'll see you again tomorrow at 11. Bye-bye.